the algorithm that is going to discover frequent item sets in the data is called the a priori algorithm and as I mentioned before let's just focus on discovering all pairs of items that are frequent because it's very unlikely that if we choose an appropriate support threshold that the number of trip frequent triples and frequent quadruples is going to be uh, large because at the end we want to have a manageable number of association rules and so we don't want to blow up the number of uh, frequent triples and quadruples so those are going to be very small and so the main processing uh, time is going to go into uh, discovering frequent pairs of items so let's just focus on that and we can always extend the technique for that to triples quadruples and so on so in order to discover frequent pairs the a priori algorithm is going to do two passes as we've seen before and this two pass approach is going to limit the need for main memory so if we had to discover frequent items frequent pairs of items frequent triples of items and so on all in a single pass that would require a lot more main memory because then we would need to keep track of the counts not just for singleton items but also for pairs of items and triples of items all at the same time so the amount of memory required would go up but if we have a multiple pass approach specifically a two pass approach for discovering frequent pairs then that limits the need for main memory the a priori algorithm is going to use a property called monotonicity which is defined in the following way if a set of items let's call the set i appears at least s times so does every subset j of i so let's say that the set i has k items and let's say that the set j has a subset of these items the monotonicity property says that if we look at the support of j and if you compare it with the support for i the support for j is going to be at least as large as the support for i and why is that because if all of these k items are appearing these many number of times then clearly a subset of these items will also will will be appearing at least these many number of times because any subset of the of, of the set i is appearing whenever the entire set i appears in a basket moreover the subset could probably appear in a few more baskets right so if j for example is just i1 and i2 it's possible that i1 and i2 could appear together not just as part of uh, not just with the other elements of the set i but there could be some baskets which have only i1 and i2 or i1 and i2 with some other items which are not part of the set i so this is one way to state the monotonicity property if the support for i is um, s then the support for any subset of i will be at least s will be greater than or equal to s there's another way to state this property that if an item i does not appear in s baskets that is if the support for the item i is less than s then no no superset containing the item i can appear in s baskets so this uh, 
converse property here is stated just for pairs of items so let me just uh, explain this for pairs and then we'll look at this in a more general way so suppose the support for just the item i by itself is less than s okay so the number of times that i appears in the transaction file is some number less than s now consider any other item set where i is paired with some other item j if i itself is appearing in less than uh, uh, less than s number of times in the file it's clear that this pair of items together cannot appear in s uh, cannot appear s or more times right because if this pair was appearing s or more times then an individual item in the pair would be appearing at least as many number of times as the count of the number of pairs so in general we can say that if the support of a set of items i is support of i and if this is less than s then if we take a superset of the set i the support for the superset will also be less than s right in fact the support for the superset has to be less than or equal to the support for the subset as we've seen here right the support for the subset has to be greater than or equal to the support for the superset so if the support for a set i is less than s then a support for any superset of the set i will also be less than s because it has to be less than or equal to the support of the subset so if item i does not appear in s baskets then no pair that includes i can appear in s baskets the a priori algorithm is going to use this property of monotonicity so these are just two different ways of saying the same thing so what will the algorithm do in the first pass it will read all the baskets one by one in the first pass and it will keep a count in main memory of the occurrences of each individual item so in the first pass we are only keeping track of counts of individual items so as we saw before if there are capital n items in the store then we just need to keep an array of size n each cell taking up four bytes which will be sufficient for us to count the number of times each item is appearing in a basket as we pass through this file and keep in mind that this file is this file could be huge so it may not fit into the main memory of a machine so we are typically looking at files that are so large that they are stored on a hard disk so not all of the file can be brought into main memory at the same time we are doing something similar to the the passes that we had in the external sorting algorithm where we just bring in the next section of the file into the main memory buffer and operate on it and by operate on it we i just mean that you note which items are there in that particular block that is fetched from the disk and then update the counts for all the items in that block and then move on to the next block so at the end of the first pass we will look at this count array and note which items appeared at least s times so s here is assumed to be the support threshold so any item that has a frequency higher than s is by definition a frequent item so at the end of the first pass we would have discovered all singleton sets of the form you know just the singleton set i where i is an item which are frequent item sets so frequent item sets of size 1 would be determined at the end of the first pass now in the second pass when we read the same file again so we will again read all the baskets one by one and as we are looking at a particular basket which will consist of 
a list of items. We are going to keep track of counts of pairs of items in the second pass. But we don't have to we don't have to count the frequencies of all pairs of items because we can use the monotonicity property to say that if a singleton item, so if there was a particular item i which was not frequent, which was ascertained as not being a frequent item at the end of pass 1, then it's clear that any pair in which i participates, that is any pair in which one of the items is i, cannot be a frequent item set either because the frequency of that pair will be less than or equal to the frequency of the singleton item i from the monotonicity property. So we, we just have to keep track of those counts corresponding to pairs of items where both items within a pair have been determined to be frequent. If either items of a pair, let's say we look at any arbitrary pair i comma j if either i or j is not a frequent item set then i comma j cannot be a frequent item set either so we are only going to require memory that is proportional to the square of the frequent items so let's say that the total number of items in the store is n and at the end of the first pass, we determine that m out of these n items are frequent. Okay, at the end of pass 1. So, m will obviously be smaller than n. Uh, and what we have to keep track of in the second pass is just pairs of items that are created from these m not pairs of items created from all the original set of items. So the amount of memory that we are going to require in the second pass will be proportional to the square of m, right? where m is the, f uh, the number of frequent items at the end of pass 1. And obviously we have to know which m items are the frequent ones so we may need to keep track of uh, which items were ascertained at the end of pass 1 to be frequent so that when we are looking at an individual uh, item or a pair of items in the second pass we can just determine by looking up the list of frequent items whether or not the pair of items we are looking at are both frequent or not if they are not we just do nothing we just ignore that pair and then we look at the next pair that is generated from the basket. We check if both items in the pair are in this uh, list of frequent items or not. If both are in the list of frequent items, then we will update the count for that pair. Uh, and there will be at most MC2 such counts. And at the end of the second pass, we will again look at all the counts that we generated during this second pass and see which of the counts has a value greater than or equal to the support threshold s. All pairs which had a support greater than or equal to s will be classified as frequent item sets of size 2. So here is a visual uh, depiction of that. During pass 1, we are just keeping a single array which I showed over here of size capital N. We are counting how many times each of the items is appearing in the file. And then in the second pass, we are going to choose a subset of them. So these are capital N in number. In the second pass, we will choose, uh, we will keep track of only the frequent items from this set, dropping all the other items. And we will keep track of what these item IDs are for the frequent items. So this can be done using a simple hash map. So where you know the key of the hash map is just the 
item ID which is a, of the item which is a frequent item. So I just store in the hash map all keys corresponding to the IDs of frequent items. And if I have to ascertain whether a given item is frequent or not, I just check whether the key is present in the hash map or not. If it is, then it's a frequent item. Otherwise, it's not a frequent item. The rest of the memory is going to be used to generate the frequent, uh, to generate the pairs of items from from each basket, and then to maintain counts of those pairs where both items in the pair are frequent. That is, both items in the pair belong to this set of frequent items. So you'll keep track of uh, these counts. Either you could use a triangular matrix uh, solution where the matrix will be of size MC2 or you could use the hash map based solution where only when a particular pair of items is detected in your uh, during your pass that you will add an entry for it in the hash map. And obviously we are assuming here that both i and j ha are frequent. If either of them is not frequent we don't even bother to uh, generate any counts for this pair. But if both of them are frequent then we could add a count for it in two ways. If you are using the triangular matrix notation uh, then we will just add one to the corresponding entry. Otherwise, we will just add an entry to the hash map if there isn't an existing entry. And if there is an existing entry in the hash map for this pair, we'll just add one to its count. By the way, if we use the triangular matrix notation to keep track of counts of these pairs, then we may have to renumber the frequent items from 1 to m, just so that when we create the triangular matrix, our indices are varying from uh, 1 to m for the items so that we can use the formula that we developed pre uh, previously to determine at what location in this triangular array should we look up. I mean obviously this triangular array is going to be represented as a unidimensional array. So we know to, need to know the exact index where we need to look up for a given pair i comma j. So that will obviously be easy if our items are labeled from 1 to m. Whereas if we use the original uh, namespace where the item IDs had 1 to n, then, the, then our triangular array will need to be of size nc2 instead of mc2. So we have to renumber the frequent items from 1 to m if we use the triangular matrix notation or if you're using a hash map then uh, we don't need to do that either. We can just directly take the original IDs, i, comma, j, and then just add an entry to the hash map. So this is what I just mentioned. We will, if we are using the triangular matrix method, we will have to renumber the frequent item sets from pass 1 uh, to be in the namespace 1 to m, where m is the number of frequent items. So let me just call this as m. Uh, m is the number of frequent items ascertained at the end of pass 1 and then we can uh, renumber uh, the items from 1 to m and then keep track of what the mapping was from the original IDs to these uh, new IDs in the namespace 1 to m and then we use uh, then we build this triangular matrix and keep track of the counts in that matrix and again, how do we decide whether to use the triangular matrix method or the hash map method? Well, it all depends on how many pairs of items we expect there to be. Um, uh, how many pairs of items we expect to have non-zero counts for. So if we expect to have non-zero counts for most of the MC2 items, then it may make sense to use the triangular matrix uh, method, which will save space compared to the hash map solution. But if we don't expect too many pairs of items, so that is we expect the number of uh, pairs with non-zero counts to be less than one third of MC2, then we can go with the hash map solution.